And good afternoon, everyone. Let me hit got it on being recorded. Hopefully you're all comfortable with that. We have been recording these sessions because, you know, on a Friday, it's a hit or miss whether that's a good day for people to participate. And so we share it out into the world um, for those who are unable to join us. So just to thank you for that. Um, for housekeeping, if you will, um, if anybody's new joining in, please participate in the poll that Trista has shared and um, that uh, Kimberly had given to us to gather some feedback. I think that will inform her approach with us today. And in the chat, if you will, I've already done so, put your name and your organization. And um, we love to see who all is participating with us today. Um, what business, for profit, not for profit, we don't care. Um, just a citizen um, that you represent. So please join us in doing that. And I am so excited. I have been so excited to have um, Kimberly Petway with us today to do this training. Um, just a quick backstory. So the South Alabama Coalition of Nonprofits in partnership with United Way um, in 2020, um, you know, um, decided to just increase our efforts to offer trainings to our community around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's been a wonderful journey. We started first with just surveying um, our constituents across our community to see what the needs were and how we could help facilitate learning opportunities. And so we've got a few under our belts now. We started offering them back in March. And um, personally, in 2019, uh, Kimberly came in person, what a concept, <laughs> and did a training with our staff team at Big Brothers Big Sisters and was just amazing. She was great. And it was so informative and eye-opening and just uh, thought-provoking for every participant, every team member around the table. And it's really changed us as people and as an organization to challenge ourselves to continue to be educated and to open our minds on how we can better um, just help people and do our mission. So I'm excited to introduce Kimberly Petway. You all have her bio. I think it was shared by Trista. It's so impressive. Read it later. <laughs> And, uh, but she's been with South for 23 years, but her whole life's been dedicated to social work and um, in a broad, um, broad areas to impacting our community. So without further ado, Ms. Kimberly Petaway, just the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday. Uh, thank goodness we still have Zoom to use, right? Uh, most people don't want to come to meetings on Friday. So this is great. I'm so honored to be able to uh, speak with you today. Uh, we only have a short time, so uh, I'm going to try to get as much in as I can. I wanna apologize, I am having some difficulties here. Uh, my laptop fried a couple days ago, so I've been trying to utilize an older one, but it won't allow me to do the PowerPoint. It would slow the machine down quite a bit, I think. So. Um, I won't have that visual presentation for you today, but I can get it to Amy and get it out to you guys if you uh, would like that, sure. Uh, so I had asked to um, just a couple of questions at the beginning, just to gauge how, um, how much individuals have been dealing with or addressing or learning about bias. When we talk about unconscious bias initially, you know, we kind of default to issues around race. Um, and we're such a racialized society, that's just what we think of initially, but there are many biases that we can have. Uh, but I asked specifically about race because I do believe that how we have normalized racial bias in our society has been the father or mother, I shall say, of all of the other bias legacies that we have uh, in America as well. So just looking at the polls, um, we, I asked if you had received training of any kind on bias, and it looks like of those who have answered, we have about 35 participants and looks like about 24 have answered. I'm moving that out of the way because I don't know about you guys, but my poll keeps just popping in the middle of my screen. So I don't want to get in the way of me seeing you guys. 
So um, have you received training on bias of any kind? It looks like uh, 67%, which is about 16 participants have said yes. And uh, now what is interesting is the next question, which asks if you know how race was created in America, uh, roughly the same percentage uh, says no, right? So I would like to see the day that when we do any type of training on uh, bias <clears throat> of any kind, that it is associated with understanding those foundational uh, principles that we, we must understand, right? So, so often we have received some training on bias, but nobody's talking about these historical creations that fuel the bias, right? And so I would imagine, uh oh, that's my phone ringing. I'm so sorry. I, I, mean, I don't know how to turn that off. My apologies there. Uh, so when do we say, uh, when you've received training, can you guys just give me like a quick uh, five second um, kind of um, comment on what type of bias was your training on? What did it, when you said that um, you have received training, did it deal with race at all or gender? Anybody? No, yeah, I, I see heads shaking. <laughs> yeah, there's one comment was race, age, disabilities, gender, et cetera. Um, yeah, LBGETQ community. So there's been, yeah, race. Okay. Unconscious. So yeah, this is Audra. I think um, a lot of us have received training within like the last two years, <laughs> just because it's kind of at the forefront of, you know, right, everything right now. So, right. And so we have seen a lot of um, attention giving to these uh, concepts with uh, many of the disheartening things that we've seen in America over the last couple of years, I, I would have to agree. So most often, if you guys think about it though, when we do trainings on diversity or inclusion or bias, we tend to steal other communities of color or other targeted communities. And so the training that's supposed to broaden our horizon, our, our horizon, sorry, actually further perpetuates these same ideals of othering one another. And so for example, when we have training, say for instance, on race, right? What we often do is look at our communities of color and help others to understand how to effectively engage these communities. These are the things that you need to consider. These are the things that you need to be mindful of. Uh, but what that does is just reinforce the othering of those communities. So I'm a firm believer that with any training we do, you have to get to the basics, right? We have to go back to where this all began. And so only about eight of you so far know how race was created uh, or legalized uh, in America. And then I see that about four of you think that you don't have any undiscovered uh, bias and, and that's good. I wish you could show me how you did that because I haven't figured that out yet. So I am going to uh, push my poll down so that I can see you guys. So what I'd like to do is just before I jump into the what is bias and the different types of bias and what we can consider, what we should consider moving forward, when I address bias, I look at it again from a racialized standpoint. I mean, that's the lens through which I see the world. So most often when I'm talking about bias, it's a racial bias. But we know there's gender bias, I mean, certainly uh, there's bias based on sexual orientation or religious ideals, whether you're from the North or the South, uh, whether you're an Alabama fan or an Auburn fan, right? I mean, there are bias out there all, all over. And it is difficult to escape uh, having those biases and largely because they have become so normalized in our society that we don't see it as an issue and we don't take the time to really unpack ourselves. So let's begin with racial bias, right? <clears throat> Probably uh, one of the most pronounced biases that we see in our community and that we've certainly seen an um, resurgence of uh, in my lifetime that, that I have 
lived through in um, the last few years. So I ask about the creation of race because most of us have no clue where these social identities come from. And in order for us to effectively address our own bias, we have to situate ourselves, right? How I see me, my bias towards anyone else begins with how I see myself. And how we see ourselves is often rooted in social identities that have been assigned to us and all of the value or disvalue of those that have been assigned to us. And most often we see in our society that begins with the creation of race. Where did this come from? You know, why is it a thing to even have a bias uh, about? And it has probably, I would say, has been normalized so that many of us just don't even think to dissect it, right? Dissect it. How do we unpack what we don't know exists? So I want to just give you a quick, um, quick summary. Sorry, my, now my dogs are acting up, but that's the downfall of, of Zoom. I apologize. Uh, I can't figure out how to keep those guys quiet. So if you know a trick, let me know. I, I can't figure that out. So when we look at race in America in the late 17th century, uh, we began to see um, efforts to racialize individuals and we would eventually begin to legalize these concepts. But what many don't know is that we haven't always been raced. We haven't always been uh, categorized based on our uh, um, ethnicity and, and largely our features. So one of the most pronounced, um, I would say events during that time was Bacon's Rebellion. How many of you are familiar with Bacon's Rebellion by a show of, yeah or no? Yeah, a little bit, okay. So what, during this era, we had already began to see scientific data that suggests that there was a hierarchy, right? There was this racial hierarchy. We had scientists who were uh, coming in contact with people who were different from themselves and feeling the need to classify and understand. You know, we, we all have that desire to kind of box people, I think. Okay, where do you fit in? Who are you? You're different from me. And so during this era, as we began to explore and conquer, certainly during that time, they were enge engaging people who did not look like traditional Europeans. And so there was a need to try to classify. And what we did is uh, created these scientific hierarchies that we know have been disproven over and over again, right? You guys remember the skull sizes, right? That um, African Americans or Africans were uh, inferior to say because they had small brains and, and because their brains were smaller, uh, you needed to control and conquer them. They could not be left to their uh, own demise, or they, if you left them alone, it would be at their own demise. And so these concepts uh, were already kind of floating around during this time as explorers began to um, enter into different territories, recognizing those who were different from themselves. And so in America, what we had were indentured servants, quite frankly, before we racialized individuals. Uh, we had freed Africans who were here, who owned land. Uh, we had indentured servants, both black and white, who worked side by side with one another. And during Bacon's Rebellion, which is probably one of the most um, significant uprising of, around the creation of race is the powerful, uh, those who were the few, the powerful and the elite uh, European conquerors recognize that these um, indentured servants, both black and white, were collectively working together. You know, they, they were, they did not see themselves as different. And there was an incident involving Native Americans that this group was dissatisfied about. These indentured servants uh, were dissatisfied about. Now I'm greatly summarizing this, uh, but I want you to realize it's really simple too, right? We want to think that there's this two hour explanation as to how race was created, but I probably could give it to you in five minutes because it was really simple. And, and so during this time of the uprising, those in power, like many of us would say, you know, we can't have that. How do, how do we conquer and divide? because they outnumber us. And if we allow them to come together, 
then it would be at our own demise and we can't do that. So we already have these racialized ideas, this scientific data already floating out there. And what we did was create the idea of whiteness and the idea of superiority. So during this time in an era to conquer and an effort to conquer and divide, we created a racial hierarchy, a hierarchy that says, if you are white, you are superior, you are normalized, right? You have the right to be here. All those who were not were, de were othered and deemed inferior. When we look at the creation of race in America, it was created solely for conquering and dividing. And that is important to understand. It was created to deem one race superior and all others inferior. We're talking about the late 17th century here. So then we began to legalize these ideals. One of the first we saw was a law that would forbid uh, African men from marrying white women. And that was one of the first times where you saw this idea of whiteness that was legalized. Now, I want you guys to keep in mind that this was so foolish in my opinion that everyone who even quote, looked white did not get the status of being white. And I share that because I want you to understand just how we continue to create and recreate and create and recreate, you know, if there was a biological, some biological evidence that if you are of this race, then I can associate these characteristics to you, then we wouldn't just keep adding and taking away people, right? It wouldn't be that simple. But what we did was pretty much the same as if I was to you or shorter uh, or superior and anybody that's 5'3 or higher or inferior. It's just that simple. Here we are in the 21st century though, still adhering to that hierarchy, still walking in these ideals of race that many of us don't know uh, how they were even created. We accept it as the norm. We accept classifying as the norm. And because during this time, what we saw was the beginning of very intentional efforts to create a path of superiority and a path of inferiority, right? It made people say, well, get over it. That was a long time ago. Well, that may be easy to do if we still weren't walking in the legacy because the path that was created still very much exists. So I deem, I tell those who were working side by side with those servants, black and white, I tell those who were white, say, hey, you come over on our side, you look like us, you're white like us, and we're gonna give you authority over them. But if you join with them, there will also be consequences. So if we catch you rebelling with them, then you're gonna have consequences. If we catch you helping them, you're gonna have consequences. So a very clear divide was created, right? And those who were once servants now got a chance to come over to the, the, the big side, the popular side. Well, what they didn't know though, is while they conquered and divided you, you were never given the privileges and rights uh, that the powerful elite had. And so we see that legacy still today. Race was a social construction for the purposes of conquering and dividing, period. That's why it was created. It has no biological merit or predictive value outside of how we have socialized people into these tracks that we gave them when we created race. It is so important for us to grasp that. In one of my courses, the one article I used said that race was the greatest scam in American history. That we would have people to believe that you are either superior or inferior solely based on your phenotype. It was a creation. And I wish we could just stop there and say, it was a creation. Everyone knows it was a creation. It means nothing now, carry on. But unfortunately we don't because then we created a legacy, a history, a, a narrative that supported this superiority and inferiority. And in America, you can't escape it. It's on the TV, it's how we taught history, right? It's how the media portrays different communities. It's how we engage in, with one another in a day-to-day, -day. how we, uh, our structural foundations 
were created with these things in mind. And so one thing that I tell people when you consider bias, the first thing is realizing that you are not who you think you are. And that is for everyone. I am not a part of this superior normalizing community because the idea in and of itself was a creation. We created it and then created a narrative to support it. So we have to backtrack to situation, situate in ourselves to see, wait a minute, what exactly does that mean? Now that could be racial, that could be Christian, right? Christian bias. At, as a Christian, I have to realize that how we have normalized these ideals in our society and other, um, other belief systems or, or religious ideals um, is not uh, something that is factually based. It is just a creation. There's privilege that I have. As a male, right? Uh, we live in a patriarchal society. The how we have structured and narrated gender norms was done very intentionally to continue these patriarchal norms and create a sense of inferiority among women. It was all with intent, guys, and a narrative was created to support each of these ideals. The fact that we are a racialized society today and very few people even know where race came from <clears throat> is troubling. I could talk for a couple of hours on how we then created a narrative and structural entities to, to support these ideals, but we don't have that time. And I would encourage you nonetheless, if you really want to dissect these ideals, if your companies want to really dissect these ideals, then please uh, contact me so that we could begin that process. Because what we have to do is start doing a lot of unpacking of these ideals. So I, I, you know, we're, we're groomed in a society that tells us because you are something, because you look a certain way or believe a certain way, then these are attributes that you have that I generalize to you and we normalize those ideals. And so bias then sets in. We like to think that we're the most open-minded individuals, right? That we don't have any of this ugliness that exists with, within us about who people are. But the reality is it is our norm. Bias is our norm in America, throughout the world. So when we look at unconscious bias, first of all, let me stop there. Any questions at all about what I just uh, shared? Because I did a very quick jump in on the creation of race. And what we don't have time to do is for me to dissect the narrative for you. And how do we get from there to 2021 and we're still racializing people? How do, how do we get there? That's a different training in and of itself. So I'm gonna to jump to uh, bias. <clears throat> so I want you to realize again, when we created this idea of race, then we began to legalize it. You had to be white to own land. You had to be white to be a citizen. Even though the Irish who were clearly European, uh, their phenotype was that were not given the classification of whiteness uh, when they initially arrived. Anyone know why, when, and how they began to get that classification of whiteness when they were allowed to come up under the brick umbrella? It was when they began to show rebellion against people of color who had, they had otherwise aligned themselves with. Right? You see how powerful that narrative is. So a part of embracing this ideal, this dominant culture, was simultaneously connected to oppressing others, right? We invite you over to our team, but one has to embody the ideals that oppresses others. So to do that, I have to believe these things are true. I have to believe that these people are not normal, that I am the norm. I have to believe that there's something inherently wrong uh, with them. I have to believe that if you're not Christian, then you are a witch, right? what we saw very early on uh, in American history. These ideals continue to perpetuate themselves. And so biases become a part of who we are. And so what is an unconscious bias? Well, it's an attitude or stereotype that we accumulate throughout our lives. 
It influences how we think, how we see others. It influences our decision-making. And it's often based on a very uh, inaccurate picture of those who we are engaging. But it begins first with situating ourselves. How do I see me in relation to others? If we do not step back and assess our own internal biases, it can lead to a world of issues. And what it does is continue to recreate these norms uh, that I gave you a very brief overview of, right? And it's gonna affect who do I bring to the table? Who do I engage? Who do I support? And so I want to share with you just five different types of biases that we see. An affinity bias <clears throat> leads us to favor people who we have, who we feel we have a connection with or that we're similar to, right? That's an affinity bias. We believe that those who uh, have similar characteristics of ourselves to ourselves, and we will have this unconscious and sometimes um, overt bias of, of those who are a, not a part of the groups for, for in which we associate ourselves. That could be a racial group, that could be socioeconomic status, uh, that could be a religious affiliation. We also have a halo effect right, when we talk about biases. And that occurs when we perceive one great thing about a person and let that halo glow, right? And so then it distorts our view of individuals because the one thing that we have perceived and associated with that person, uh, we think trumps everything else. And so there may be a bias towards them. So if we look at race, for instance, it could be if you're a part of dominant culture or, or not, right? When we look at attribution um, uh, that we use for infinity bias, it could be your gender affiliation. It could be your racial affiliation that I feel connected to. Now, any of us can have bias. All of us can have bias. When we get to issues of racism, then I believe that is a totally different conversation because racism was indeed created by and for dominant culture. And you have to have the power to impose structural inequities. And only one race of people in our society has the ability to do that. But when we talk about bias, it could be any of us. Another type of bias is the horns effect. So that's gonna be opposite of the halo effect that we um, just mentioned. And so it is, uh, it occurs when the perception of someone is unduly influenced by a negative trait. When I have someone applying for the job and they come in and they have a visible disability do I immediately downplay their qualifications for the position that perhaps they are applying? I've associated just this one negative trait that I have perceived. Another that I think we often use in the horn effect is how we articulate, how we speak, right? When we see that others don't speak in a manner that we would feel uh, to be appropriate English, or there may be uh, broken English, et cetera, we associate that directly with intelligence and tend to have a bias against those who don't speak as we expect them to in America. And then we have attribution bias. It affects how we assess other people and their achievements. It can be particularly harmful. Um, I think you guys may have, uh, there's a, I don't follow sports, but there's this one, uh, sports um, caster who mentioned that someone, uh, another um, lady who's also a reporter got her abilities because she was African-American. Like the only reason they accepted her or gave her these opportunities is because they need to diversify. So the need to diversify allowed you to trump me or, or get an opportunity that I didn't get not considering that it could be that that person was just equally or more qualified for the position. But I'm just gonna attribute that success to what I visibly see and that is a need to 
diversify. And then we have confirmation bias. It's a, a tendency to search for, interpret, focus on, and remember information that aligns with our preconceived opinion. This is when we get into that powerful, powerful narrative that was created during the creation of race about who people are. And so I'm going to look for those things that support my opinion of who you are that has been normalized through the creation of a narrative that has conquered and divided us for centuries now. So those are the five types. If you consider any of those, they are all relied upon or dependent upon the type of narrative that we have embraced about who people are. So I could very clearly say to you today that I don't have a bias towards men. I, I, I don't have that bias at all, but what do I believe about men though? Right? So if I have these ideals embedded within my head or embedded within my person about who a man is or what a man represents, I can clearly just sit here and proclaim, no, I'm not biased. Yeah, but I think they're all kind of idiots on occasion, right? That's what we do. No, 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 I, I, I'm not biased. I, I just, I don't think they're as smart as women though, right? So all of us, I think, would proclaim that we are not biased. So I say, don't ask yourselves that. Ask yourselves, what do you think about different populations of people who are different from yourself? What do I think about white culture? What do I think about religious ideals? What do I think about the LGBTQI community? And what am I basing those ideals on? What I share with my students in my power, privilege, and oppression course is when people begin to try to box you and box your beliefs, the number one question we should ask is, says who? Says who? If I am looking for an employee and I feel like I may need someone that has a certain strength to be able to lift objects or something, I, I'm saying very uh, simple, something very simple. And I've made up in my mind that I'm probably gonna need a man for this position because a woman would necessarily not foot the bill. Says who exactly, right? When I am um, looking or engaging individuals and say I am in um, uh, my daughter or son come, comes home with someone from a, a different racial category and I, I am not racist. I don't believe in all that ugly stuff uh, that happened in our history, you know, at all. I mean, it was just horrible. And you have my utmost sympathy and empathy for all that you've gone through. But dear, I don't think he or she's the right person for you. That's based on what? Says who? When we start to ask ourselves these questions, that is when we will begin to dissect our own hidden biases. Because I want to, again, guys, say and stress that it's all a creation. It was created to do exactly what it's doing now. And guess who's playing a role in the perpetuation of it? Every last one of us. Because if I am not fighting against it, then I am adhering to it. If I don't actively address these ideals, if I don't actively address these beliefs, Right? If I don't actively try to educate myself and others, then I'm merely leaning on the, the narrative that, that was presented well before our time. And that gets into what we call cult cultural or social hegemony, which is definitely another lecture in and of itself. The one thing that we have to recognize when it comes to having bias is we must go and dissect why we think the way that we think. And when we do so, we will find that all of us who think that 
that we are independent, free people deciding our own fate or often walking robots in a narrative that has existed before us that we've never questioned. But I just believe, I have to be careful. You be careful when you go over into that Hispanic community now because you don't know. They can be a little violent over there. I, I mean, they're good people and I don't, I don't have any type of uh, racism or anything, but you be careful over there. And so my response to it would be, can you show me the, the data of the last person that went into the community and was harmed based on being an outsider or being non-Hispanic? And then the question, the conversation ends, right? These are ideals that we have, that we are unaware of that begins with first identifying myself and ourselves. And again, we aren't who we think we are. The attributes that we give to ourselves were created for purposes. If we walk in them, we are fulfilling that. If we reject them, then we're making headway. But how does one give up privilege? Who wants to, right? I think all kids are, are the same and everyone has a right to a, a very, um, good education, uh, but I mean, I you know, we I don't really want you to bust those inner city kids over here because I mean they're good kids and, and they have I want them to have all the opportunity. But then if they come over to the school, then we problem we might start seeing problems. Are those problems there because they are just innately bad kids? As does the environment that allegedly embraces them? reject them and even a kid can feel that and their behavior begins to reflect your perception of them, right? It takes some time, it takes some digging. So what can we do uh, to try to address some of these biases? Well, I, I think the first thing that we can do and what I've tried to illustrate to you guys is that it's normal, we gotta normalize it. It, it is what it is. We all have them because we've all been victim of the same improper teaching of history We've all been victim uh, of a capitalist system uh, that has normalized the exploitation of others for wealth. We all exist within an environment where we have significant socioeconomic gaps and we just, you know, it's just, it just is. And so in order for those things to occur, there has to be a bias towards or against. And it's just normalized but it's, it has been normalized based on a history and teachings that are false. Because this isn't just the way it is. It is the way it was created. And that's what we have to mind, be mindful of. Second thing that we can do is identify biases that you have. Ask yourself, how would I feel if someone walked through the door um, and are looking for a job and they don't have on the type of uh, attire that I think they should? Or, or how would I feel when someone begins to talk and I think their uh, English is broken, therefore I judge the, their intellect based on uh, their broken English? How would I feel if I, uh, my daughters or my sons um, say, hey, I wanna go to spend the night at such and such house and that person uh, is of a, a different ethnicity or a race or a religious belief. How would I feel about those things? And more specifically, where do I get those feelings from, right? What is it based on it exactly? And I know that you guys are all professionals in the community and that uh, much of what you guys do in your lunch and learns is to be applied to your working environment but we cannot unpack and address unconscious bias in the workplace if I don't first unpack it in me. And I carry me wherever I go. I've tried to duplicate me and leave me at home sometimes and, and um, you know, uh, forget that I am me, but it doesn't work, trust me. Because sometimes I am even victim to these ideals, right? When I am on the plane, uh, have I ever said an extra prayer when I saw someone uh, of Middle Eastern descent. Did I do that? Why did I do that? What's wrong with you, Kim? You know better, right? That's when I want to separate me, but I can't because I 
seeing the narrative, I've watched the news, right? And I even me who know better, I will still have those thoughts. We also got to broaden our knowledge. We got to educate ourselves on who people are. The way we present data in our society based on rates versus raw numbers continues to perpetuate the narratives that we see, right? When I tell people that <clears throat> in Alabama, white women outnumber black women three to one in Tutwiler, they're like, huh, say what? What do you mean? Yeah, in Alabama, white women outnumber black women in Tutwiler prison three to one. That doesn't fit the narrative. They don't grasp it. But what we will see in data is that African Americans or Hispanic Americans are overrepresented. And we assume that means the majority of. The largest demographic in, uh, in Alabama, and I'm gonna uh, disclaim that I haven't looked at the data in the last year or so, but the last time I did probably uh, was about a year and a half, couple years ago. And looking at the data that the largest demographic of poverty uh, was among rural white women. And for 13 years, when I asked my students in class, can you tell me who makes up the majority of poor in, a in Alabama? Everyone says African American, even the African American. This is what that creation way back in the 16th, late 17th century intended. And it's still working and we're all victim of it. And we're too smart for this, guys. We are too smart for this. And we have too much knowledge at our disposal. So we have to broaden our viewpoint. We have to engage others who are different from us. But uh, let me caution you that when we do so, that you don't seek one member of a group to speak for the entire member of the group. As you begin to engage other people who are different from you, I can't go have a conversation with Amy and say, I just really want to understand Southern white women, perhaps. Let me go talk to Amy. All right, Amy, let me tell me a little bit about yourself and why you made this decision. Okay. And then I go back and I say, well, y'all, white women, Southern white women do, but I've only talked to Amy. All right. So we can't make people responsible for an entire group of people. Everyone is individual. And yeah, we have cultural similarities and cultural norms and ideals, but we have to stop the broad generalizations. Get to know people for who they are. So when you are uncertain and when you think that your behavior in the workplace or your policies in the workplace have hints of bias in them, it's time to self step back and do some real soul searching to discover where those things are coming from and how do we undo what we've done. Educating ourselves and engaging people who are different from us, trying to understand their beliefs. It's probably one of the most important tools because whether I admit or acknowledge that I have a bias or not, those things will help me certainly uh, in my effort to reduce the impact of bias on my engagement with others. So I know we have to stop for questions and I see comments um, that I will address. Uh, one, a lot of time those biases are rooted in fear and a sense of fear, which is a powerful emotion, absolutely. If you look in our society, especially when we look at uh, racial bias, uh, fear is at the root of so much, the fear uh, that we will be conquered, right? The fear uh, that I will be held accountable for what I'm doing because it is wrong, but to justify it, I need to create a narrative that supports it, right? Uh, the fear that our America will be taken um, from us, right? As communities become more diverse, the fear that individuals will come and take our jobs, you know? So we can't allow those people at the border in because we already don't have enough jobs for us. And if we let them come in and they're gonna take our jobs and. And we've used fear mongering for so long. It's been a very effective tool when in fact, uh, we don't have evidence that such occurred. So 
are there any more questions out here? Or I feel like I have dumped a lot on you guys in a very short period of time. And it's very hard to do. Typically I use PowerPoint just to hone my, my uh, discussion in to make sure I touch on uh, particular uh, pieces that I think are, are most important, but I couldn't do that today. So I hope that I still stayed on task enough that it was meaningful for you. So do we, I will stop now and allow uh, any questions. Or, sorry, I'm trying. Hey, Kim. Hey, Brian. Um, I think you've touched on this before already, but at what point would bias be part of human nature and which part would be learns and how can we tell the difference? I, very good question. I do think that bias has been normalized. So like in, in our society, again, we often believe that race, the creation of race created racism, right? but it is my belief that racism birthed race, right? The need to classify and deem myself superior births my classification of others. And so we have normalized it so much in our, our society, right? That a lot of it is learned behavior, but no one sat you down and said, this is what you need to believe. It's just that we have created a society that embraces those ideals, right? And so it becomes a part of who we are. I think bias that tends to occur when we feel threatened or inept in any kind of way are those things that we can tap into, right? That I, that I am personally embracing because I feel threatened by those individuals who I feel should not have the uh, ability to or authority to make me feel such a way. And that's when I believe we start with the conscious decision-making, right? That I'm acting on my own sense of feeling inferior or my own sense of, of not uh, feeling safe. And then so I project that onto individuals through the biases that I've adopted over the years. Does that answer at all, Brian? Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Kim, it's Catherine Pittman. Hi, Hi hey. Catherine. Um, are there any societies um, that you know of that do a better job of treating everybody equally than others? Oh. I mean, I'm kind of thinking, you know, and I, I haven't had a lot of experience going other places, but sometimes I think the Europeans, you know, I've been to Europe a couple of times and you know, I'm only there visiting a short time, but I just feel like possibly they they do it well, treating every, I mean, I know, I know it happens everywhere. Yeah. But I didn't know if there was any societies. I, I cannot think of, I, I think certainly there are areas that are a lot better than what we see here, but I cannot think of an area that is doing such a good job that I feel like, hey, we should model after that. I can't, but keep in mind, Catherine, I'm typically not looking at those areas, right? My attention is is where the where we see the um, disparities. Um, so I can't say. I will say one country, Brazil, I feel like has a unique <clears throat> opportunity to do that. Though I don't know if you guys um, have are familiar with uh, Brazil, but you will have families uh, with the same mom and dad and one child will identify as white and the other child will identify as black. So when you see the families together, you often see a very diverse group of people because it's based solely on phenotype, right? And, and, and in America, it's like the one drop rule, right? You're African-American where, where in, in Brazil, it's like if you have any white heritage, you could deem yourself white. I think they have a unique opportunity because you have people who hold these classifications that exist within the exact same family, right? So I can't, I should not be able to conquer and divide you based on false beliefs because you are from the exact same family. And so I, I think that has, they have the power there to really dismantle some of the ideals. I found that to be very unique, but I really can't say uh, that I'm aware of any society. 
anyone else may, someone else may know, but I can't think of anything that stands out. Any other questions? I know you guys are watching the chat. I have one, but I don't want to take away from anyone else. Yeah, come on with it. We still have like nine minutes. All right. This is something I've been talking I've been thinking about the past couple of weeks. Uh, you mentioned generalizations, right? Um, how we see the actions of one person and we generalize it to mean their entire demographic, whether it's based off of race or sex or sexual orientation. Um, we also see that in cultural settings, for example, like families. So if someone in the family member has done something bad, people tend to generalize the entire family um that way um especially in some cultures as well uh what about one thing that i've seen especially in the news for example the olympics um one of the team members did something really bad and people have that nature of generalizing the entire team to be that way mm -hmm. um but yet it seems that we've normalized that is that something that we can unlearn, that we should talk about, or, or is that one of the acceptable generalizations that we have in society? General, generalizing people based on uh, racial, I think, and gender identification is so normalized in our society. To me, it's actually sickening. Um, and I, I think that what we have to realize is that those generalizations often occur, though, towards targeted communities. Right. And so I'll give you an example. Well, like you said, the, the issue with the Olympics. Right. Then. So we began to generalize that to all of those who are part of that team, especially if they look like the Olympian. Uh, generalizations will be the death of all of us, in, in my opinion. I hate generalizations of any kind. I'm always preaching against them. Uh, they fuel a lot of the divisiveness that we have. But I keep in mind that we only uh, overtly and very intentionally, uh, consistently, let me say, generalized targeted communities though. When um, uh, the gentleman in Vegas shot up the concert, right? You guys remember that? And we had the mass shooting at the concert where there was no discussion following that on how uh, violence perpetuated by white men. <clears throat> there, there was no conversation about, you didn't see uh, comments around, you know, white men are just so violent, we need to da 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 But then at 9-11, right, when we had 9-11, not only did we generalize such, but we began to target people's, people, well, people different uh, beliefs who look like and held similar beliefs. So the generalizations that we hold, um, I think when we see them being unhealthy, we have to ask who exactly are we generalizing? And if we're only generalizing targeted communities, then there's something very uh, wrong with that, right? We have to see people as individuals, but that is really not how we're groomed. That's not how uh, we operate as a society, especially in our engagement of people who are different. Uh, than us. And then some of us even embody those generalizations. You know, when you are a part of a targeted community, uh, you sometimes we embrace those generalizations uh, about us. Uh, but I think they have been um, strategically used uh, to continue to target certain populations. And, and I think generalizations of any kind are very unhealthy, though. I, 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 I don't, I, I cannot find value in generalizations, right? I just, they're too destructive in my opinion. Thank you. Dr. Petway, you, you said something that was extremely powerful to me and it's going on my whiteboard whenever we finish this conversation. I'll quote you, don't worry. Um, you said, if I'm not fighting against it, I'm adhering to it. And that is going to stick with me for a very long time. And then you went on to expand on what we can do to address biases and you said you know we have to identify it accept it for what it is um and then broaden our knowledge after those steps are taken and and i understand that this is continuous but after those steps are taken 
does it then become an internalized behavior change implementation? And how can we, how, what are your thoughts on expanding that within our agencies and our organizations so that we can activate all of our staff to do the same thing? Absolutely. I think first that it begins with just that, acknowledging that, you know, like you said, if we're not fighting uh, against it, then we're adhering to it. And that, that's how hegemony um, exists. And it's so powerful, you know, that we, we uh, make everyone believe that this is the norm. So even those who are targeted by it, accept it as the norm. But within our agencies, I think that you have to first start with those two steps, recognizing what, you know, my own during that internal search. But as a leader of your agencies, you can challenge employees about how they believe and what they believe when you see hints of this bias existing. One of the things we have to be mindful of when we begin to seek our knowledge, that a lot of the knowledge out there, though, is washed, right? So we got to make sure that the knowledge we're getting is actually accurate and true. And as a leader, say, if you're a CEO or ED of your agency, then pushing that knowledge out. And when you begin to see hits of uh, rejection of it, rebellion toward it, or discomfort, I think that opens an opportunity then for you to come in and do more work. You know, I, I, my goal is to make the people that I engage feel uncomfortable about these topics. Because if you're feeling uncomfortable, then I at least know that you're listening. It's challenging your dissonance and your understanding. I mean, you're having some dissonance and challenging your understanding. And that could be a place where I could ease in and help you to really rethink how we're processing this information. So um, I think that sending that out first to staff would, would be a, a first kind of, hmm, that's interesting. Because if I am not, then how am I? You know, if I'm not fighting against it, I say I have these belief systems, but if I'm not doing anything to dismantle it, what exactly am I doing? It is the first place to, to start. Uh, but once you see that resistance, or, or once you even see just the interest, I think, uh, is an opportunity to then provide education like we're doing right now. And then that education will then cause us, hopefully, to go back and kind of really dissect ourselves. And then I would do a follow-up after that to say, okay, we've talked about this. You had some opportunity to really process. Now let's talk about how we're feeling and how our actions are either contrary or supporting ideals that we say we stand against. Um, I hope that helps. So uh, after that training, I would certainly, during training with your staff, I, I would set aside some time to go back and revisit it. I actually believe that coaching helps as well. When you have someone who has a lot of biased ideals that continue to perpetuate themselves, I think one-on-one -on -one coaching becomes very important. And um, I don't think that's been normal. It hasn't been normalized in our society. You know, why would I want to spend attention with someone who was a sexist or you know a racist? Or well, I understand how these ideals have been dumped on and in them, and I want to help them understand it as well. So I'm always all, all for coaching uh, when we find that the issues are kind of beyond uh, what we can do in a group setting. All right, so it looks like I'm about out of time. I want to thank you guys again. Whenever I'm given an hour to do this stuff, uh, my heart pounds because it can take so long. And I know everyone doesn't have a, a half a day or a whole day to sit around and talk about these things. But I do hope that there was something that you can uh, get from it. I also hope that maybe it will uh, help you or encourage you to do more uh, intensive training. I mean, we have to do intensive training around these ideals to undo them. Uh, it's as if we were born into them and we just embrace it all unknowingly, quite frankly. So if I can be of any help. <laughs> and I'm Miss Petway, by the way, not doctor yet. <laughs> Kimberly, thank you so much for being with us today. And you're so right. We, I'm sorry we only had an hour, but, oh, no. you know, but, but you're right. It takes so much more. And I, I think the takeaway, everybody, you can't help but realize this is a journey. There's no one, you know, it is a journey. And just know we will probably reach out to you to be on this journey um, for further discussions down the road. And um, 
I, you know, I've only had some limited opportunities to participate in trainings with you, but I love your says boots. That's my takeaway. So to your point, you know, um, if everybody leaves with some actionable item to reflect on this for themselves, but long before those we affect, you know, it just starts with ourselves. I think we'll all, we'll all be better. So thank you for just your patience and educating us all today and um, just giving us this time. It's a busy time at USA. Y'all just gone back and you yeah. caught this time out for us. So we're super grateful and have no doubt that the demand will be for you to join us again. So to delve Thank deeper. You. Thank you guys for having me. And, and one more comment I would say as far as taking it back to your employees too. One way that you can tap into their beliefs is uh, a, do like an assessment uh, of those beliefs around data and facts, right? Who do you believe is the majority of this or how many people you think are represented among this race of people? And once that can be a starting point, it's a, often a starting point when I ask, you know, who do you think gets this service or who do you think benefits from social welfare and things like that? that's when you really can easily tap into kind of what some of the ideals that your staff members have. And, and as I won't even say that it's, it's their own fault. It's just how we present data. Right. And so that's a starting place as well. But well, thank, thank you. Guys. you. I really appreciate it. Uh, everyone, there'll be a recording of this and we will get the PowerPoint, you know, from Kimberly to share with you all um, in case you're a visual absorber too um, and want to revisit. Um, and we will, we don't have um, this date for our September training book, book chip, but we do have um, speakers on that for September, October, November. I mean, this is monthly, may need to be weekly. And, um, but we appreciate everyone's time. Trista, thank you. And Kimberly, just thank you again. Thanks to all of you for carving out the time to be with us today. Thank you. Thank you. You guys have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. How are you guys doing? Was that you asking, Leslie? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just I dipped out of my meeting for a second because it looked like you guys were winding down. I didn't know if you needed me to do something at my end or like if, if you guys can close it or if you need me to. It looks like Trista's gone, so it looks like I have to do it. Okay, I'm ending. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.